So it's the little things like that where you're being sold this manufactured fantasy of how things would be if you were together, but the reality is never really going to line up with it. She is dark as obsidian. And it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun. The salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The people of the desert need a blood. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again. For those who need to hear it, the black woman is God. Let me say it again, the black woman is God. Shit, you in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. Welcome to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo. Listen up. Listen up. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, the original wireless woman, and welcome back to my spot, room 303. If you are new, welcome to my crew, but my returnees, you know what we do. If you like this video, well then like this video. Let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling above we'll go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link welcome wifis welcome back to another cult of personality episode of the wireless woman and in this series we are building a glossary of terms for the narcissistic abuse survivor and yes this talk of narcissism and narcissists, it's everywhere, but more than likely you're going to encounter one either in your workplace, in your family, in your intimate relationships. So why not move that needle of mental health along from generation to generation and begin to have these discussions about how we deal with highly combative people. I mean, bullies, have been the center of discussions since the 80s where it was pretty commonplace to have a bully caricature within the scope of a storyline. But now, 20, 40 years later, we're really seeing this be a pervasive part of the society in which we live. And in every good storyline, at some point, your protagonist has to get the goat of that bully. And that is what the Cult of Personality series is all about, taking your power back. And today, we will be talking about shared fantasy. But before we get into today's content, you already know what time it is. It is time to call the roll. So I need all of my imaginators to the front of the class. It is time to read aloud. All right, welcome into another Cult of Personality episode of The Wireless Woman. Go ahead and do me a favor on your way in and like this video. Why? Because when you like it, well, I love it. Also, make sure that you leave me some comments below on how you're feeling about the channel, what content you would like to see, or just anything you want to get off your chest. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And share this content. So today we will be talking about 
shared fantasy. And shared fantasy, I think, is something that's very susceptible, more so for women in some ways, I think, than men. Even though as of late, I've seen a large transition in gender roles and gender identity. So I can't say this isn't men's experience where they really have a large amount of idealization around their partner that kind of allows them to live in a fantastic space where magical things are possible and not necessarily pay attention to very real and glaring red flags. But I think especially as we grow up into adulthood, the inability to deal with the reality of most things is something that's more pervasive in women than it is in men, which is why I think so many more women fall into the traps of narcissists. What makes a woman so much more susceptible to that type of manipulation and deception is shared fantasy. We as young girls in our playtime developed our playtime around a lot of real life activities, playing doctor, having a baking set or or a kitchen, you know, playing house, you know, so a lot of our play was still within the realm of real structured activities. Like we were set up from a young age to mimic real life as a form of play. So for that reason, women can end up being very highly suggestive when it comes to fantasy. You know, our greatest fantasy sometimes as women was partnership, marriage, children, family. You know, a lot of us have been pushed into the realm of career, success, business, finance. And not to say that that's not our place because we embrace it and we do well with it. And of course, women are just as, if not more so adept at leading in those areas, in those arenas. However, we still as women were created to work and live in partnership with men. Whether you want to, whether you enjoy being in that space, you were created as a help meet. And ultimately, all of the things that you do to develop yourself are still for that purpose. And so a lot of our conditioning goes into that, goes into homemaking. The thing that makes us so great at the head of industries and finances are the same skills and technique and character that you have to lead a home and be a leader in your family. So these are not mutually exclusive, but at the same time, very little of a woman's childhood is dedicated to actual fantastic, irresponsible play, fun. You know, this is one of the things that make narcissists so attractive to, you know, responsible, strong, smart, capable women. Like you think you got into this relationship because there was something deficient in you, but more often than not, especially if you're deeply entrenched in a narcissistic relationship, you're actually a person that can hold a lot of things together. And that's something that makes you attractive to a person who doesn't have those qualities and those abilities. And what makes them attractive to you is their reckless, wanton ability to abandon logic and reason. That is fun for a person, particularly a woman who has always been responsible, you know, from a young age for outcomes, you know, and particularly in the black community, a lot of times younger black girls and women are responsible for the family, for the younger children, for the community, for the homes, for the outcome. So, When do you play? Where is your play? Where is your fantasy? And we all derived this ghost dad, this 
you know, ghostly father figure. It's the reason why so many of us are so deeply entrenched in religion because we've adopted this belief that at some point this Prince Charming, this God figure, this Jesus Christ, this man is going to swoop in and save us like Cinderella from all of our labor and hard work and responsibility. You know, that is the hope and the goal for a lot of women. Especially now when we talk about hypergamy and dating hypergamously, we're really looking for a man that can come in and take over, take it from here, you know, and it's weird because at the same time we're being touted as the group of women that don't want to submit, baby, if they knew the truth. If they knew the truth, we just been waiting for somebody to come in here and pick this up. Here you go. Here you go. Here's some bills that you can pay. And here's your daily reminder that Magneto was right. Cheers to you, Magneto. The war is still coming, Charles, and I intend to fight it by any means necessary. We also have to look at how that magical thinking, that thinking that this person who hasn't been raised like us doesn't know what we want out of life, wasn't conditioned to just automatically be our partner, isn't just going to magically swoop in. But one of the largest manipulative tactics of a narcissist to gain your trust is shared fantasy. And I had to learn this the hard way, but they are those people that go out on the date with you and they sit with you and they will ask you this question. This is almost always the first question. Not necessarily does it mean that everyone who asks you this question is a narcissist, but it's definitely something to look out for and to respond to in a certain way. But they're going to ask you this question very early. What do you look for in a man? What are you looking for? What is your ideal man? And then you basically supply them with all of the qualities and characteristics that you're looking for. And then poof, magically it shows up before you. And then you meet me and your whole world changes because everything I say is everything you've ever wanted to hear. You're going to hear things like, oh, me too. All my life, I wanted someone that was like this too. Or that's me. That's exactly how I am. I'm the same way. I'm straightforward. You know, don't lie to me. Just tell me. Don't waste my time. But you'll also begin to see early on in that relationship as they tell you stories about relationships or situations they've had in the past that not everything they've told you up front about who they are lines up with what you can see in their life. You know, like a 49 year old man telling you he's always wanted to be married. No, sir. No, you're you're not looking for a wife for 29 years and not finding one. At that point, you're Indiana Jones, sir. You're Indiana Jones. <laughs> you're on a quest for something that don't exist. So you have to really, and, and if he's saying he really wants to be married, does he have a budget for an engagement ring? Has he bought one? Does he have his own place? Does he have savings? Does he have life insurance? You know, there are certain things that a man who's preparing for a partnership and a marriage is going to have in place. You know, does he have children? Does he have a good relationship with their mom and with those children? Does he have a schedule that's conducive to having the amount of time that you need to invest into a relationship that you're building up for marriage? You know, I meet a lot of men that work a lot. They have two jobs or they work massive amounts of overtime, but they will tell you that they've been wanting to be a husband for years. How sway? How? I mean, do it yourself. How fact, sway? You take a few. Because you don't even have the type of schedule that's conducive to the type of relationship that you say you're looking for. So it's the little things like that where you're being sold this manufactured fantasy of how things would be if you were together, but the reality is never really going to line up with it. And what's so 
infuriating, nauseating, and frustrating about narcissists is that even if you can give them all the things that they say it takes to have this magical fantasy life with them, you're going to see that fantasy move. It's like the person that loses 10 pounds and now they want to lose 20. They've lost 20 pounds and now they want to lose 25. And the truth of the matter is, if you're a person who's losing weight and you've gotten down 20 pounds, if you don't shoot for 25 pounds, it's very hard to maintain the 20 pounds even that you've lost. You kind of always got to stay in a what comes next mode in order to accomplish goals. You know, you've got to have a goal sitting right on the other side of the goal that you're going after so that complacency doesn't set in. So it's actually a good thing. And you'll find a lot of times that in a relationship with a narcissist, you are doing more than you thought you were capable of. That person is pushing you, but there's a place where that push can turn into a pull. It can turn into an addiction to unobtainable things. Things. You can begin to live in a fantasy that's not indicative of your reality to the point that you can lose touch with reality. There's a balance to it. And that balance, a narcissistic person is never going to find. And you will never find <laughs> as long as you're in a relationship with them. There's always going to be something else that needs to be done, someone else that needs to be attended to, some other situation. But the goal is to make all of that disappear Madagascar penguin style and to keep you focused on the carrot that's just out of your reach. If you could be more this way, if you could do less of that, if you could be more of this, we could have all of this. But why I think women and black women in particular are so susceptible in into being manipulated like this in these narcissistic relationships is because that's what America is. It's microchasm, macrochasm. Everyone has a vested interest in continuing to see the deception of black women because we contribute so much with so little in return. You know, we're seeing a lot of black women moving into the heads of industry, trucking, construction, finance, medicine, science. And this is a beautiful thing. It's great. But the reason why we're seeing that is because you're able to get such a highly skilled, intelligent, driven, motivated person at the cheapest price. Oh, that gender pay gap is real and it's still there. I would take somebody, gas them up, tell them they're great too. If I was paying them 56% of what I would pay a white man to do the same job. I mean, in this economy, eh, gas prices are high. Eh, give me two black women instead of a white man for that price. They're going to work harder than him because they have to to prove the point that they belong here. We're not going to get all this pushback from them about their value and their worth because they're so busy trying to prove it that they're not going to assert it. Anything that we say or do, we're automatically going to be looked at as the angry black woman. You have to think about it that way. Everybody from the top, from white men, all the way down to black men benefit from keeping us as the slave class, as the labor class, still proving a point that hasn't been made yet after all these years of value and worth that we've given to our institutions, to our families, to our workplaces. And we're still having to prove the point that we belong there, that we deserve to be there. So we're being sold a fantasy that if we work hard enough, we get these degrees, we do all this, we can have a piece of pie slices that have already been handed out to everybody else. So it's no wonder that we see that same dynamic being manifested in our homes, in our relationships, in our friendships. Capitalism. But you have to come to a place where you break the mirror. You have to come to the place where you deal in reality in what is when people are telling you that you're not good enough for them for whatever reason to believe that, to say, okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. 
we're going to have to walk away. It is Exodus time, you know, for all of the work that they were putting on those Hebrew slaves, they were expecting twice the bricks with half of the resources that were needed to make it. The more that they squeezed that hand of oppression, they said, okay, well, you know what? Just let us go. And they were like, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, even though we're telling you, you're not doing enough, even though we're not even giving you what you need to do what we've asked you to do, we're still not going to let you go. So understand that the hold that we see in these abusive relationships, the hold that we see in these industries, in our companies, they're not going to let us go, though. They don't really want to see us leave, though. They still all over these podcasts and social media sets complaining about us, wanting us to change, wanting us to be more agreeable so that they can be with us. Don't don't miss the mark. Don't miss the setup, because at the end of the day, they still want you. They still need you, even if for nothing else but a fallback. So you got to be aware of the game that's being played and how it goes. You have to deal with what is and the reality that we're being faced with, which is we have more value than the fantasy. We have more value in reality than the fantasy of who people want us to be, who people think we are, who they want to see us be. We have more value if we just stay in reality. It is time for us to unplug, even from our own hopes and dreams and beliefs of of the magic ghost in the sky that's coming to save us from all of our worry and fear and labor. We just have to keep showing up and doing the work. And we have to turn our eyes to reality. You know, that's a big part of the accountability that we're being asked to take, the responsibility that we're being asked to take. It's in reality. You know, I have a lot of men that get upset at me for the things that I say, but then when I need my oil changed, I have to go do it myself. And they talk to me at great lengths about their feelings and how I make them feel. Because here's the thing, I also make men feel great and feel good and they want to be in relationships with me. But when my words that come from reality hurt their feelings and make them feel bad, guess what? If wishes were horses, then beggars would ride them. All the hoping and wishing and anger and upsetness and emotions that you have in the world don't change the reality of what is. It doesn't put that man in your home helping you to raise children, build generational wealth, build your businesses and your families. It, it, these arguments, these it's all fantasy. And if I can't keep you wrapped up in the fantasy of believing that I love you, that we're going to have a family, that we're going to do all that, then I'm going to wrap you up in the confusion of why don't you want to be with me? Why couldn't we just make it work? Why can't we all of it find its basis in fantasy? What doesn't find its basis in fantasy is reality is the work that we have to do, is the fact that 70, now they're saying it's as much as 84% of black households are led by single black females. That's the reality. So now let's take that reality and deal with what is and stay in that reality no matter how painful it is so that we can move the needle of progress forward so that we can raise these children with sound, healthy mothers that are doing the work on themselves to present for these children a better future, you know? And if in the event of doing all of this good hard work, you find that partnership that you have been longing for and desire, well, then you can approach it in reality as well. Is this person a good earner? Does this person have the same value systems that I have? Is this person accountable? Do they text back? Are they, you know, independent? 
or are they codependent? You know, you can approach these relationships with reality. You're not in love after 80 minutes with this guy, you know, because shared fantasy hurts us all. Shared fantasy wraps us all up on a hamster wheel that doesn't get better over time. That magical thinking that a person who's done no work on themselves, their character that has nothing to offer you other than hopes, dreams, and wishes that, that makes you pray for them and about them more than any other thing that you can contribute to your relationship, that a person is going to magically show up and fix all these things that you already had going on in your life. That is fantasy. It's a fantasy. And you're going to attract people that are living in a fantastic state if you don't deal with reality, truth character, you know, things that can actually be measured, things that you don't have to believe by faith with closed eyes, you know, things that you can't even speak against or else it's not going to happen. Like this isn't a wish that we made on a coin that we threw into a well. This is our real lives and you deserve the respect and the dignity of being able to live in reality with someone that can show you that they love you as much as they tell you that. Break the mirror, unplug, be unbothered. Okay, they over here, they over there doing whatever they do. <laughs> Here's your reality right here. Get up, wash your face, pay your bills, go to work, take your kids to you know their practice, do what needs to be done in reality and stay there and enjoy that. And love the work that you do. And if you don't, put your hands to something that really brings out the best of you and who you are. Read, get some hobbies, grow a garden, and be unleashed. You can't get to unleashed until you unplug. Because as always, I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki, your neighborhood wireless woman, urging you to unplug unfollow not me though follow me <laughs> but unfollow the trend that's telling you that you give more value to things than the value that you have yourself how does that make sense you're spending more than you make when the things that you are doing and taking care of other people with are more important and more valuable than yourself do you really think your kids are more important and more valuable than you are do you really think your husband is more important or more of your boyfriend, your baby daddy is more important or more valuable than you are when he's deriving his value, their value from you and how you treat them and how you take care of them. It's just not the math ain't mathing. So go ahead and ascribe that value that everyone else gets their value from to yourself first. There's no way to deduct from zero. You're everything. You're every woman. Every woman. It's all in me. You are just as valuable, if not, in my opinion, more so than the things you ascribe value to. You don't need fantasy. You are the real thing, the real deal. And I look forward to encouraging you, talking with you in these comments. I will meet you there. But until the next episode, class is now dismissed. You took my soul from me. You left a hole. No, Sister Terry, if it's over your head, jump off the live, baby.